Okay, so today we're going to look at two stories of two women thirsting for something more. One searching in the waters of life, the other one drowning in the waters of the world, but both searching. Let's pick up our story in John chapter 4. John chapter 4 and verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now the disciples who were with Jesus had gone off into the city to buy food. And we see Jesus sitting beside the well. He was faint from hunger and thirst. The journey since the morning had been long, and now the sun of the noontide beat upon him. His thirst was increased by the thought of the cool, refreshing water, so near yet so inaccessible to him. For he had no rope nor water jar, and the well was deep. The lot of humanity was his, and he waited for someone to come to draw. A woman of Samaria approached and seemingly unconscious of his presence, filled her pitcher with water. Now, this woman is a wreck of a woman. Her life is a mess. She's a disaster and many people know it, none more than herself. She's been married and divorced five times, but she's gonna give it a six go. And the man she's living with is not her husband. She's humiliated, she's deemed immoral. Not only that, but she's a Samaritan, and according to the Jews, that means that she was a lesser breed of a person, a lower class human. And in the culture of the day, she was a woman which carried very little value. So here she is at the well in the middle of the day, which is not culturally common, and it's quite possible that she came because she knew that the other women who came in groups to meet there wouldn't be there. Maybe she didn't, maybe she wasn't welcomed by them anymore. So she comes at a different time by herself. And it is in this day, in that moment, that Jesus comes to this woman. He on purposely smashes down a bunch of barriers a bunch of social norms, of societal accepted ways of doing things. He comes in and he goes crashing through one wall after another after another as he says to her, excuse me, can I have a drink of water? I see you've got your water pot there. Could I have a drink? Shocking. He knows it and she knows it. Let's see why, verse 9. The woman of Samaria said to Jesus, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, the Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. As far as possible, they avoided any and all dealings with one another. To trade with the Samaritans in case of necessity was indeed counted lawful by the rabbis, but any and all social intercourse was condemned. A Jew would not borrow from a Samaritan, nor receive a kindness, not even a morsel of bread, not even a cup of water. Our people hate each other. What are you doing talking to me? Get this. Jesus completely ignores what she says. And he goes on to begin to tell her about the water of life that she has been in desperate need for. The one who was thirsting in her very soul was in fact her and not him. He says, if you knew the gift of God. Now let me ask you, what is the gift of God? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, 
that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is the gift. So he says to her, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for the water that never runs dry. He begins to teach her about eternal things. He calls out her sins. He says, where's your husband today? Why don't you go and get your husband? Ooh. You know, sometimes when you do target practice, you've got the circles in the middle, the aim is to hit the bullseye. Ezra's got a bow and arrow, and he's always aiming for the bullseye. Well, Jesus, in that moment, bang, hit the bullseye. I can just imagine her looking around. Uh, um, how do we even get here? She felt a terrible hour of conviction because there was this sin in her heart. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, I know. Verse 18. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you have spoken truly. You're a wreck, and I know it. But that's why I have come here today. There is something very strange about this man talking to her. Something extraordinary, and it's beginning to stir in her heart and her soul. Who is this man, and why is he saying these things? And it begins to draw her, and she says, verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And watch this. What does Jesus do? Jesus says to her something he has not said to any Pharisee, any scribe, any priest. Verse 26. I who speak to you am he. Wow. Did you get that? Jesus just revealed himself as the prophesied Messiah to her. Of all people to her. A woman broken, full of guilt, unworthy, and he revealed himself to her. Jesus had convinced her that he read the very inner, deep secrets of her heart. Yet she felt that he was her friend, pitying and loving her. While the very purity of his presence condemned her sin, he spoke no word of denunciation to her. But in fact, he told her about his grace and that he was the one who could renew her soul. And so, the disciples arrive on precision, perfect, divine timing. You know, God knows where people are going to be and where they're going to be there. And the disciples come. <laughs> Just imagine with me for a minute. In come the disciples, grocery bags in hand. Huh? Huh? Grapes dropping to the ground, milk spilling, splashing everywhere. What is going on here? Verse 27. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled. They were amazed. They were shocked that he talked with a woman and no less a Samaritan woman. Yet no one said, what do you speak? What do you seek or why are you talking with her? They were like, what is he doing? We've left him alone. Maybe the desert, maybe the thirst. He's gone crazy since we've been gone. But the woman who he had just revealed himself to be the Messiah, she leaves her water pot. She forgets why she's even there. She was going to give Jesus a drink. She's forgotten all about it. Her heart is now overflowing with gladness. So she rushes, hurries straight into the city so that she can share with others the precious light of which she has just received. As she arrives in the city, she seeks out the men, verse 29. Come, come, see a man who told me everything, all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now she knew, already knew the answer to this. 
but she was leading them to the same conclusion that she had come to, that this was in fact the Christ, the one she'd been desperately searching and waiting and thirsting for, had finally come. Her words touched their hearts. There was a new expression on her face, a change in her whole appearance. She was transformed. She was transformed by her encounter with Jesus and now others too wanted to experience. Who is this man? Can you just imagine an evangelist to the Samaritans spreading the good news of the gospel? Jesus, his goodness, his love, his grace, the peace, the hope, everything he brings. Wouldn't you pick, I don't know, one of the disciples? What about Peter? He's bold. He's coming along nicely. What about that rich guy in the restaurant? Everyone high fives him, knows his name. What about him? What about that woman at the well? <sighs> no. Not that worthless, pitiful, sinful, disgraced woman at the well. But yet, verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Jesus wanted to save this soul. This was a woman hurt, this was a woman broken, a nobody of such low standing, uh, gender, race, marital status. Yet Jesus was there. He saw her need for salvation and he came to give her the living water, eternal life. Friends, there is no one who Jesus will pass by who is thirsting for more. Who is crying out, there must be more to life. There must be hope in this heartache. There must be peace in the chaos of my mind, in the chaos of this life. There must be more. I'm going to tell you about another woman now who was thirsting for more. The story begins when she was 14 years of age. She came from a broken home, but a home where she was loved. Her home had rules, she had siblings, and she had a God-fearing mother. And even though she grew up in the church, she never had a personal relationship with Jesus. And as the teen years rolled in, so did the discontentment with life and the feeling that something was missing. When she started high school, she made friends with a large group of girls. They were nice, they were popular, they seemed to be doing well and have it all together, but for this girl, she still felt this emptiness inside. She got an opportunity and offered to move out of home. Her mum thought, this is ridiculous. A 14-year-old girl, there is no way, uh-uh, this is not going to happen. Then one day when her mother was not home, this young girl, acting on impulse, packed up her belongings and moved out with a group of young people. It was a rash decision and one that would continue in a spiral downward. I mean, have you ever made a rash decision that you've later regretted? According to the National Institute of Mental Health, Teen years are all about fine-tuning the brain. The brain finishes developing and maturing in the mid to late 20s. The prefrontal cortex is one of the last parts to mature, and this area is the area that's responsible for things like planning, prioritising, making good decisions. The Raising Children Network says that because the prefrontal cortex is still developing, teenagers might rely on the part of the brain called the amygdala, to make decisions and solve problems far more than what adults do. Now, the amygdala is associated with emotions, impulses, aggression, and instinctive behaviour. So the planning, the decision-making, the emotions, they were all factors driving this young mind in her future. So now this 14-year-old has stepped out into an adult world that she is not ready for. She got into a relationship with someone very popular, good-looking, and as she would discover, very broken. 
He carried his trauma and his abuse into the relationship. He was manipulative and emotionally abusive. She thought, I can help him. I can help mend his brokenness. Maybe that will be what's missing inside. We're all broken because of sin and what it does. But have you ever tried to fix someone else's brokenness? At the age of around 16, she was still trying to navigate this world that she was not ready for. Her weekends were always spent in the city nightlife. There were dangerous situations she put herself in. Some she only learn about later, some she can't recall. And many times she woke with the regret weighing, pounding on her mind, and nothing would fill the emptiness. As she got older, she still relied on the substance use when she would go out to build the confidence. She wanted to be in love, she wanted to be loved, always searching but never fulfilled, never finding anything to fill the missing piece. Nothing would fill the emptiness she carried. The more she tried, the heavier it became. I mean, can anybody here relate? Made a bit of a mess in your life? Made some bad choices, some poor decisions? What about an emptiness inside? Maybe you jump from one thing to another to another trying to fill the emptiness. Maybe it's relationships, maybe it's work, maybe it's food, maybe it's... I don't know. Many things in this world, we try to fill the emptiness, but nothing will satisfy what is missing. Her mother, who never stopped loving and supporting her, once told her that the nightlife she would be at every weekend without fail was, in fact, a playground for the devil. These are words that would soon echo back in this now young woman's mind. As time went on, something strange began to happen. The places she would go, the drinks that she would drink were becoming less and less desirable. She would go and the enjoyment was no longer there. Interesting, one night when she was out, she looked around the darkened room. The raging music seemed to dim from her ears. The people dancing all around her seemed to be going in slow motion and muted. And as she looked around that quiet and chaos of that place, her mother's voice echoed slowly in her ears. And she wondered, could the God that she knew as a little girl be dwelling in this place? What she didn't realise was like the woman at the well, Jesus was coming in search of her. And so she began to open herself up to the idea of him. If you knew this woman's life before, and some of you here today know it very well, you would have seen the mess that she had made. Me, you would have seen the mess that I made. You would have seen the hurt, the brokenness, the bad choices, the poor decisions. You would have seen a mess of a person, someone very different. I can tell you the truth. Many would have cast me off as no hope. Don't pray for her. She's never going to change. She's living in sin. She's addicted. She would be such a bad influence. She is too far gone. But friends, the good news, I encountered Jesus. No more did I need to hide behind the alcohol. No more did I have to go for relationships to fill the emptiness. No more did I have to live in guilt, in shame, in regret, because I tasted the living water. Never once have I regretted my decision to follow Jesus. And what I didn't know at the time was that I had a mother praying me through, and probably others. Please, don't ever give up on somebody you feel like has no hope. Don't ever stop praying because I can tell you with full surety that if it wasn't for prayer, I wouldn't be standing here today. I encountered Jesus and my life has never been the same again. 
how did I encounter him? God is so good. He sent me friends. He sent me relationships. He sent me a sister who returned to church, a loving mother, a father and wife who would open their home and gently support my journey. He gave, he gave me programs to be involved with, to be used. He gave me a community, this community right here that I love and hold so dearly. Thank you for caring for me and thank you for helping me in my journey of transformation. He gives you so much more. Does it mean that I have it all together? Whew. No. Does it mean that I make mistakes and I sin? Oh, man, you're looking at a sinner right here. Ask my husband, he lives with me. He can give you a laundry list. In fact, maybe don't ask him. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's a life full of, uh, free of difficulties and heartache. But what it does mean is that I live in newness of life because of what Jesus has done for me. Because Jesus died for me, I am free. I have meaning and purpose. I have hope and peace that this world will never be able to give. It's by seeing, it's by encountering Jesus that we are transformed. I can guarantee you, the more you look to him, the lovelier he will become. And the more you're not going to want to do the things of this world, he's going to offer a better life. In John 6:35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Friends, he is the living water. He's the only one who can fill the emptiness inside. He is a mighty, awesome, and life-changing God. Let me ask you, is he calling you today? Jesus coming in search of you today. I know a lot of people are doing it tough. Mental health is so high at the moment. The cost of living, all the things that we go through. Life is hard. Maybe you don't know him. Don't worry about anybody else in the room. Just focus on yourself right now. Maybe you've been here for many years, but you have forgotten your experience with him. Maybe you've become like stagnant water. I want to ask today, is there anyone here today who would say, Jesus, I want that living water that you offer. I want a new life. I want to experience a better life and the freedom that only you can bring. Maybe you already know Jesus and you want to commit your life again, recommit your life to him. Maybe you're after a deeper experience with him, a deeper encounter with the living water. You know who you are? And I know he's come in search of you today. He's a gentleman and he will only come in if you open the door and allow him. Don't be afraid. Once you encounter him, your life will never be the same again. Let's pray. Dear Father, what an awesome God you really are. We thank you that you are the God of transformation, that you are the God that comes in search of us. And Lord, there are people here today that you have come in search of. I pray that they will hear your voice. I pray, dear Lord, that they will open their hearts and open the doors to let you in, to have that life-giving water that only you can supply. Dear Father, I pray for those who have been here for a long time but have forgotten the experience or maybe want a deeper experience. The water runs deep, Lord. I pray that you will give that experience to each one here. Thank you for transforming my life.
Thank you for just being there and never stop loving and never stop caring and never giving up on any of us here. Thank you for the living water. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.